now it's time to create a rendering for this awesome sauce bottle. So in this video, we will start by from Fusion, export the individual bodies as a mesh object. So we could load this into Blender and then design an environment with lights and a backdrop. And everything is actually based on starting existing photo studios, which are then even rebuilt here, and then taking reference photos. So we understand how we have to set up lighting and materials in Blender. So that then when we turn the lights on, we have a nice looking rendering. We will also cover how to create basic plastic materials. As you can see here, there's a structure on it, how to make a label cover this particular area. So I will show how this UV unwrapping works, how I map actually the label then over the geometry so that then we can place the camera, place lights, design the shot, hit render, and then we have a nice image. Okay, with all that set, let's get going. We would like to bring over the geometry from our Fusion model to Blender so we can apply materials and then render it. To export it, one might think, okay, I can go to export and well, export it as OBJ. Yeah, you can, but a much nicer and also object per object approach is we go to our bottle, right click, and then say, uh, save as mesh. And then we can select the object. For example, here we can turn on preview mesh. I will hide the cap for the moment, rotate my view, zoom in a little bit. And then also here we have the refinement. So we set this to low. You can see this is really coarse. Uh, really coarse also means low in file size, but when we zoom really in, we can see eh, it looks a little bit jaggy. Um, how do you know what to select? Low is really basically good for quick rendering or for preview quality, or we don't see the object really close. Medium is kind of good as a general use. And if we really go into detail and we know that, then we might want to use high. Okay, very good. So with this setup, uh, the unit system is really important for exporting. Blender works internally with meters. So we export this as meter. This is all good. Then click OK. We then select the location where we would like to save that OBJ file. There it is, bottle, save, very good. Then we can do the same with the cap, same process. Make sure that this is meters. Thank you. And here I turn this off, then it runs faster. OK, cap. Good. So um, before we continue this save as mesh, why mesh? Uh, all 3D rendering programs use actually polygons. So that's what they mean with mesh, polygon mesh. Also, by the way, every 3D printer uses polygon mesh. So save as mesh and then maybe uh, STL is actually very common. OBJ works too. 3MF is the new standard file for most modern 3D printing software and slicers. Okay, good. So for rendering 3D printing, same process. Now let's go to Blender to get everything in. We export it as OBJ. So we import as OBJ. We navigate to the folder where we have it saved. There it is. Before we continue, forward is Y and Z is up. Otherwise it will be wrote, imported in being rotated. Import. 
Uh, we don't see it. Hmm. Well, we see actually up here we are in meters. So every cube here is a meter. When we move the mouse wheel and zoom in, you see now this switches to centimeters and millimeters. Then we can actually see the object. When you rotate your view, it can jump a little bit, like it did in my case. So uh, we can click an object, go to view, and then say frame selected. And that basically centers the camera on the object. Now we were really far away and we imported a really tiny object. So this is why in my case, for example, I needed to do this. And I'm quite sure you will have to do the same on your site too. <clears throat> Now let's bring in the next object. So import wavefront obj. Here's the cap, same settings, and look at that. It will flop position right into, no. <laughs> it will be imported right into the correct position. Beautiful. So if I select the main body, click on this triangle thing or drag it out. I can also, by the way, press N. And expand this a little bit 14.2 centimeters z axis so for the height that is actually exactly what we have 14.4 centimeters now as a little trivia if i select this and then i would like to export it over i can export this as STL, I'll use STL simply on purpose. So we know this is a different um, object. Here, let's call this bottle, blender, selection only, Z up, Y forward, export, very good. And then let's go to fusion. Here's my cap, insert mesh, there is the blender bottle open. And also here, when we bring this in, it has to be meters because blender works in meters. It was exported as meters. So we import it as meters. Yeah. And there you can see it fits in perfect, not rotated, not moved, not out of scale. It is flawless. That's actually very good also to know and be aware of because that means shall we run to the situation where we have to model something in Fusion and model something in Blender. For me, these are not two different programs. For me, these are two different tool sets. I can send digital CAD files between these two programs and they always snap right into the position where I modeled them in the other program. So let's imagine in Fusion, we built the frame of a chair and then in Blender, we bring that geometry over and then model the upholstery. Okay, with all that set, let's go back to Blender and the scene is all set up, also unit-wise, and we are actually ready to start looking at how we can set up a scene and then add materials, lights, and do a rendering. Now, before we continue setting everything up in Blender, I would like to step out for a moment and bring up the problem probably nearly every beginner will face. What do I have to do in whatever render program we are working with? It's pretty much a common issue to make my rendering look awesome because there is no make awesome render button. And the tip or the answer for that is actually pretty simple. We borrow everything, what we do in real life and apply that to our digital world. So for example, here you see there's just a room with a furniture piece, two, three lights, a white backdrop in an environment. Okay, well, that makes sense. 
here when we take a look at this, this is also quite interesting. There's the camera, three lights. Also, the two lights are behind, slightly angled, and they are very narrow and tall. And in front of the lights to the camera, so the lights are kind of like behind the object, there, is, there are the lights, and then there's this big light that shines a little bit of light here in front. And the photographer just shoots the photo that way. The ground is also slightly reflective, as we can see, not too much, everything is white. Rounded corners, for example, we, you can see there and there. These are very insightful when you take a look at, uh, at these images. And we can just go to Google and type in Photo Studio. Now you can find all ty types of configurations with natural light, for example, too. Works, no? It doesn't have to be always inside a dark room. Um, or Photo Studio car. These are actually really interesting too because you can see how huge these lights actually can be. Um, how close is this light to the object when they photograph it? Now you see this is not really very far away. Or here, how this is all set up, quite nice. So we can draw a lot of inspiration actually from these images. Even here with the, the light on top, how this then reflects on the car body, or here light being shot onto the ceiling and slightly dimming down and so forth. Obviously having a little bit of understanding of photography will be very helpful to understand even what we see inside these photos so that whatever is done on one of these photos, we can then also apply to the digital world. But trust me, looking at these photos and how studios are set up is really, really very helpful for understanding the size of lights, the strength of lights and so forth. Okay, so with that said, let's take a look at what I have here. There is my beautiful kitchen bouquet bottle. We just digitally modeled. I put this onto a semi-reflective white cardboard, bend it. Left and right, I have two tracing tablets. They're actually really useful. They only cost around $20. They are dimmable, so we can make them both uh, strong or make one light softer uh, or weaker and one light um, stronger or make them both equally strong. Also really cool are these furniture books I have for those who are interested in furniture design. Of course I teach. They're really nice books to have. But let's not get off track. You see the setup is very simple and that's pretty much not what we have there. You don't really need many uh, crazy things. Why is it actually really useful to also do a quick photograph as well? Well, because I can create myself a reference to study. Again, particularly when you're new to digital rendering, there's no make awesome render button. We need to know how stuff should look. We can imagine it and hope that our imagination is accurate. I personally find out that very often my imagination is incorrect. Um, or we just make reference images. Now in this case, fortunately, we also have the CAD model for this part, so we can really uh, use this photograph as a one-to-one. -one. But even for general purpose, um, how, for example, does everything look when we zoom in a little bit more? Take a look at the reflection. So there it is plastic, <clears throat> but it's not polished super much. There's a little bit of a structure there. We can see how strong the lights are. We can see the reflection of the room, which is darker. Then here we can see the reflection of the paper ground. 
So these are really useful images. They give me clues about where are the lights. In this photograph, the lights are in front and left and right. How does actually everything look when there's more a light behind the object? Let me see here this highlight there and there the highlight and then this area is darker. Also really interesting here, I did this photograph on purpose um, along the paper, not to show the object, but to show you the strength of the reflection. Also how here you can see this is softer and weaker and then it gets stronger. It's called the Fresnel effect. Take a look actually at this. Now pay attention to the more I go parallel to the paper, how more the reflection actually pops up. You see, it's pretty cool. So this basically can tell me now how how strong should the light reflection be? How much should the whole object be illuminated? So if this black is this really black, now it's actually more kind of like a dark gray. And this is not pure white, but it is white and it's reflective, but it's kind of blurry and I can see that there is something happening. Okay, I can, or I could continue, but I, I hope actually you start understanding now why these photographs are really useful. And particularly when we have various materials, plastic, silicone, wood, brush, steel, and so forth, take a photo take a look how does the object look like ideally maybe in in the kitchen or outside and inside in an environment like here so you can see also the differences and then you have references to make sure when you do a rendering that your stuff is actually physically believable before we jump back into blender download the zip file with all these reference images the link to that is inside the description of the video because we will actually bring in this one in Blender so we can take a look at it while we model and so forth. Okay, so to Blender, we would like to bring in that reference image first. So first, um, let's actually go to Add and then we go to image and reference then we navigate to where we downloaded and then unpacked the images i only see kind of like this text as a list i need previews there click this button then we can see the preview you can maybe select the label that's the one i downloaded from the web or select this one it's up to you I will go with this one. There we are. That is actually a really big image then. Let's click on it. With the scroll wheel, we can zoom out a little bit. Here we can see the rotation of the, um, the object. If you don't see it with N, N like Neverland or No or no nine <laughs> so n we can turn this on and off and let's set this to zero so you see i just type in the number and enter i stop no not i stop i change the rotation when i shift middle mouse button i can rotate my view a little bit there we are we need to scale this so you can press s for scale very easy there we are. And then R for rotate, but I would like this to rotate only along the Z axis. So Z, you see how this rotates along the Z axis. If you pay attention to the rotation value, then you can see how this goes left and right. And then I type in 90. Alternatively, if this pressing R and then Z for the Z axis is too complicated. We can also click and drag and then this way rotate an object into the position we need. So I would like to go into the front view. So you see then this needs to be at 90 and this needs to be at 90. 
and then with S I can scale this down a little bit more. Scroll wheel to zoom in, shift middle mouse button, rotate the view. I'm kind of like zooming around a little bit. So view and there frame selected, very good. Now the rotation works better. I can also along the Y axis and along the Z axis move this around. Pretty good. Okay, there we are. Maybe S and make this a little bit smaller. Thank you. Okay, let's actually make everything very basic from the start. We set up basic materials, basic lights, basic backdrop, and then we go in one time and refine it. So pre-setup. This is also a very common process. You don't get lost in details, block it roughly out, and then we refine stuff. Let's zoom in more, this is all good. We don't see any facets, so it's shaded actually really well. Click the object, right click, and in case it is kind of like faceted like this, right click and say shade smooth. Very nice. We would like this to have a color. There is the materials button. Click on it. Uh, it's actually called steel satin. And this is brought over from, um, from Fusion. We can keep it or let's actually delete it. Then click new to make a new button. And then we call this plastic black. Scroll down a little bit. We have here um, metallic and specular. Metallic means a metallic reflection when you have a metal and specular when everything besides the metal. So plastic, um, skin, silicone, this is all the specular reflection. We can leave it where it is right now. And then also here we have a base color that for example, should be darker. I don't make this pitch black that doesn't exist in reality, but something kind of dark. Okay. Now we need, you see, Hey, why we change this color, but nothing here is changing. And that is because this is a color that pops up when we do a rendering. But right now we are kind of like in the modeling environment. So when we with the mouse, we'll scroll further down and then go to viewport display. There now I can give this a different uh, display color. Yeah, like this. Okay. I can even for the roughness, make this more rough or more plastic to simulate kind of like the type of material I want. Mm -hmm. Let's select the cap. The cap we will make more yellowish. It's also more reflective and go up with the mouse wheel. And here we make this yellowish. Okay, now that wasn't too complicated. Now we need to model this backdrop with the mouse wheel. I zoom out a little bit. Shift middle mouse button, I rotate my view a little bit. And now we will go to add mesh and create a plane. This plane has a dimension of two by two meters, so 200 centimeters. If we recall the reference images, when I go to here and take a look at this, there you can see uh, one, two, three, four, five bottles left and right. So when I rotate my view, shift middle mouse button, then um, I can press S for scaling and scale this one down. And I would say, yeah, one, two, three, four. So we're getting close to how this actually looks here. 
Okay, I could I could have measured in the dimension of the this cardboard piece, but it's fine. We can eyeball this right now. No, because in object mode we gave this a scale, and you see there's a scale factor. This is really important to from the beginning in Blender start this practice when we in object mode. I will explain this just in a moment. If we in object mode press S and scale it, the object gets an interactive scale factor. And we would like to apply this. So we go to object, apply and scale. Cool. How do we do this backdrop? Super easy. Now, the next step is actually um, not complicated, but this involves few more steps. So pay attention. Shift middle mouse button, we can rotate the view, very good. And then we can go to object and go to edit mode. What's edit mode? When we go into edit mode, we can manipulate the geometry. In object mode, we move the object around. A different way to think about this is object mode is in Illustrator or similar programs when we move a text box around and in edit mode, we manipulate the text inside the box. So edit mode, there we are. Now, quick crash course, polygon modeling, we have point, edge and face. I can select a point with shift, I can select two points that selects then the edge, shift, three points, two edges, all four points, all four edges, and the face is selected. I can also go to edge select and then select the edges, face select, select the face. Yeah, super easy. Very similar to how the sculpt mode in Fusion works. It's pretty much very, very related. So I will go to edge select, select this one. Then here is the, the trick now. I press E to extrude. And the, after you pressed E instantly, you are in the move command and we move an extrusion out. What you do not want to do is click and then E and then click. Um, if I rotate my view, you see that's totally cricket. Beginner mistake, and I, I show you how not to do that beginner mistake. So undo, undo. By the way, uh, that is Control Z on a Mac or PC, or you, on a Mac you can use uh, the Apple Z. So how do we extrude this straight up and then move this a little bit back? Super easy. E for extrude, again, don't click the mouse button. Then we press the Z key on the keyboard. Oh, look, we can move this straight up. There we are. I would like to move this along the X axis backwards. So Z, uh, sorry, S is for rotate. R, no, <laughs> S is for scale. R is for rotate and G is for grab. So G and then press X so it moves backwards. Alternatively, we can also click on this command here for move, rotate, scale. Then this way we can move this. Okay, so now we have this ugly corner here. What can we do there? Also easy. We leave object mode. And then we add now a rounding function, kind of like a fillet to this polygon object. Here where you see this um, wrench, and that is where you have what's called modifiers. Think about modifiers like interactive features or commands. Click, click, there's bevel, click. Oh, something changed, very nice. How many segments? Maybe 10, that looks good. The, um, this is actually for the size, okay. Maybe 18, 
and the way how this slopes mm, profile with the shape we can play make it more flat or nicer by the way this is a little bit how in fusion g1 and g2 works and the tangency weight so 0.5 is g1 you can clearly see it line arc line and when we push this a little bit over it it starts to look much smoother right click shade smooth nice and smooth thing so why is actually this bevel command so useful check this out when i select this edge and move this there you see updates with it pretty awesome huh? okay let's exit it shift middle mouse button there we are so now we created our backdrop if we want we can click on this move this a little bit back so it's maybe more similar to our reference photo i control z just will keep this nicely centered perfect the next two steps is now if we take a look at this we need to add two lights and a camera i go into a 3d view on purpose then go to add and camera and then i have the move command here turned on i move this back you also see here the camera is kind of rotated crazy so zero tap zero tap zero zoom out okay so this triangle that is on top of the camera so right now what we need to do is this needs to be rotated by 90 degrees so now you can see where this uh, triangle looks towards the object i can press s to scale this it doesn't make the camera smaller it simply makes the icon smaller and then this is why uh okay oh wait sorry i'm just oh clicked on the thong uh, wrong one but when i move this along y uh it's rotating around X. When we rotate objects, we change the orientation and look at global and look what happens when I go to local. You see this? It flipped actually the position. So every object has its own unique orientation. And then based on what I, how I rotate it, this widget will change. So it does not necessarily always line up with the scene. So the X axis is along which I have to rotate it. There we are. Maybe move this a little bit back, a little bit up. Okay. Now I would like to look through this camera. We can go to view camera, set active object as camera, or can we actually already look? Yeah, we can. There we are. But now if I want to be able to move the camera while I see this object, how can I do this? It's actually easy. We will um, right click, split vertical, there we are. And then here, shift middle mouse button, I can change my position. So here is, it looks through the camera and here it looks uh, through, well, not the camera, but I can see everything in like more freely. Okay. Left and right, we need a light. Okay, so add and then lights area. Very good. Move this back. There we are. Now again, for size reference, we can see these lights are maybe kind of like tall. A little bit less than double as high, so maybe one third or something. Okay, 
So first we need to rotate it. We are in local. So nope, this way. 85 degrees, 90 degrees. So it was really nice and parallel. Then I can get this closer. We said this light is height wise a um, little bit more than a little bit less than double. So we can press S and scale this one down. But that's not really what we want to do. So undo. Let's go to the light because it's important that we change the shape of a light correctly because it emits energy. And we don't want to just press S and scale this around and then it doesn't really, uh, or it, it changes the strength how it emits light. Now, when we go to light here, we see that this light icon is actually not a point or sun or spot, it's actually an area light. It has a strength of 10 watts and a size of 100 centimeters, so a meter, so that's a big light, and the shape is a square. I can make this a disc, ellipse, rectangle, square, rectangle is what I want, because then here I can adjust the scale. So um, when I rotate the view, we can make this a little bit wider and then this a little bit less uh, tall, move this up a little bit, still way too big. So that maybe is a little bit closer. This is still more than double, so This is maybe more how this would be. Okay, very good. We can move this down, maybe a little bit back. There we are. So one light coming from the left side. Then, now in this view, before we continue, by the way, let's hit save. Save, I go to the desktop, and then there I say, uh, Kitchen. Okay. With the mouse wheel and my mouse on the menu, I can scroll here the icons. So there I have wireframe shaded, then a viewport shading and rendering. Okay. Yeah, then there we can see how different this actually looks. Good. Quite a lot of light coming from that side. When I set this to zero, there we see, and the whole scene is kind of mm, flat, a little bit illuminated, but when I turn this light to zero, why is there a little bit of light left? Because when we go to the world, the world here has a color. So when we set this white, there you see, it can be used for brightening it up. Think about it when you're inside a room and there are no lamps on and you have few windows, the room still is bright inside because light from the outside indirectly gets through the windows into the, the room and illuminates it. So here what we can do, we can set the background color to white and then very gentle, lower this, maybe 0 0.1, still too big, 0 0.01, 0 0.03, yeah, maybe. Okay, let's go back to our light. 10. There we are. We need to make a copy. To make a copy, we can control C, control V that made a copy, and then we can drag the copy over. 
and I would like this to rotate. Why is this rotating and not this one, which is highlighted? So good, this happened. This is not the active object. This is still the active object. What's active object? Here, shift click on this, shift click on this, shift click on this, shift click on this, shift click on this again. You see how these are all dark orange and this is bright. Shift click this one. No, the camera is dark orange. This is bright orange. The last selected object is always the target or the focus object. And this while orange wasn't really bright orange. Meaning the previous light was still active. Uh, long story, long, st long story long. Um, but what we simply have to do here is make sure the object we want to rotate is selected. And then there we are. Yeah. And did you pay attention to what's happening here? Look at that. So when I move the lights around, you see how it gets stronger or weaker. Then we can also move this back and forward that rotates the light position. So let's actually go back to the image here. There we have the reference. So there's a little bit of a gap. There's a light gap light. So this tells me that the lights are like, as we can see inside here, they're a little bit more in front. Very good. Okay. So shift left mouse button, click both objects. And then when we do this, by the way, you see they, ugh, they go each one its individual way. That makes sense because we're using local orientation. So every object which I'm moving moves along its own local orientation. So you see X goes that way and X here goes that way. Shift select the two objects, G and X. So it's for grab and X, same issue, escape. But when we switch this to global, and then it works. Okay, there we are. This is maybe a little bit too reflective. So now select the object, go to material. Where do we have reflectivity? There it is. Aha, so this is the strength. And then here's roughness. You see? The reflectivity is too strong. Let's dial this down. Okay, now let's compare this actually with the light, uh, not the light, the reference image. There you see now quite clearly how I tried to match the strength of the light, including also the softness of the reflection. And we're pretty close. Um, yeah, what do we have here? So we can set kind of like the same roughness as maybe a tick to strong one. This is definitely reflective a little bit. Okay. Good. Yeah, not too bad actually at this point. Before we continue, maybe let's take a look at the collection here. Right click new collection, drag this one into the collection, double click the collection and say references. Right, uh, left click, 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 okay. And then we can say down select this reference image. I can't select it. Or turn the whole reference off, makes all the objects hidden. We can go to don't show it, don't show it up in rendering. For references here, definitely we want this to be turned on, uh, off. So when we do a rendering, it doesn't show up. 
who is the best friend in life? Actually, the best friend in life is the save function in Blender. Do this on a frequent basis. Good. Okay. Now um, we could select the, the light here and say now 50, make it stronger. Ah, this is too strong and 10. This would now be a matter of matching the photo and the rendering. And what about two? That's actually interesting. You see with two, how much light comes from the right side and not from the left side. And this is kind of like what I mean. This is digital photography. It's so easy to do. Oops, at five. So the left side is a tick stronger. It's really nice to see what's happening with the cap with a little bit of light. You can see this is brighter, darker, and then really bright. And the speed is pretty instant. Good. So far, we used something called Eevee. Eevee in Blender is the real-time render engine. Think about it, the engine that's inside consoles and computer games. Very fast, interactive, not necessarily very realistic. So again, let's do one time a visit to our best friend. Then we go to render properties and look at that, Eevee. Eevee, we switch to cycles. Cycles is a more um, realistic render engine, but also slower. Cycles, and there we are. The difference might not necessarily look that much different, but if you pay attention to the shadows, you can see there's already a noticeable difference. But otherwise, Eevee is designed to be very fast, to ex free explore a scene, and then when we like what we see, we switch to cycles, which render slower, which will consume more time. But because we set everything up with Eevee before, it's okay. Very nice. We can zoom in a little bit more. Yeah, that's all good. Now you can see when we zoom in, it's kind of coarse, and then it step by step gets more refined. Okay. Also here, now we can switch between back the modeling, somewhat shaded, then the um, rendered version. This is actually a good moment to also point out that I am here demonstrating Blender 3.0. So the development version, which is not the public standard version. The reason why I make this clear is when you work with the public version, so version 2.93, you will see that these buttons are at a different position than where they are here in my video. So the differences between the current version and the development version are very often extremely tiny. Sometimes elements move around a little bit, but not too much. Also, while we will go into it, for example, the sampling area is slightly different in the new version compared to the current version, the software develops constantly at a really fast pace. So things will change a little bit and improve. So I also point this out, show you look up other videos, just be aware of what version they might work with and there might be slight differences in the interface, but it's not really a major difference. So it should be fairly easy to accommodate the interface differences. Okay, that's that. Let's go back to the lighting and we will take a look at the photo 
we have and then try to see what can we do to match our lighting inside our 3D environment so we get a rendering that is close to the object. Before we continue, however, let's go to here and let's take a look at this image. You see there's a lot of light. Uh, we have this light, the back light, this light, but also here we can see his shoes. There's all light behind the cube here, that face that has light, or it's bright actually, it's illuminated, while the lights here are, well, not shining at it. And even here we can see a little bit on these walls. So what we can observe here is we have two types of lights. Direct light, all these light sources, and then indirect light or environmental light. Now when we go back to Blender, here we have our direct light. So the two light sources left and right. And when we go to the world, we have another light source. That's our environment. The process that really helps setting up lighting well is we select all our light sources and simply turn them off. So there you see the world environment. When we set this to zero, it's completely black. When we set this to one, I have as a color just white. It's very uniform and you can see it looks kind of flat. So the world light is more something when we use it, we might really use it to brighten up the dark areas a little bit. But again, the best process is first turn everything off. Okay, so now we can select our first light and say, how do you look with one watt, two watts, three watts, five watts. See, it's getting dark, uh, brighter and brighter. 10 watts, okay. What about 20 watts? And then there we start noticing, oh, this is maybe a tick too bright. The interesting part about photography, what most of you with a smartphone are actually not aware of, is the photo we see is adjusted by the sensor and the software that runs on the smartphone. So the colors um, are balanced out, the brightness, the darkness, the colors, etc. So it's not the photo we see is not necessarily the way how the environment really uh, the, the sensor sees the environment. I'm talking here about color management or tone mapping, color adjustment. So let's actually go to render properties and then we go down to color management. Scroll down a little bit. The view transform here, they call this film. When I go to standard and switch to film, there you can see already that with standard, ah, this looks like nice and high contrast, but this area burns out a little bit. So this film already makes sure that we cannot have a white area that is overexposed too much. And then we have a look. And with the look, we could say very low contrast, very high contrast. Oh, look at that. You see, this is actually getting closer to what we had there before. No contrast adjustments. What about medium contrast? Uh, medium high contrast. Okay. So the, the image got a little bit more of brilliance. So the reason why actually I went to this now is this will adjust the way how the lights actually will feel. So you can see how there we have a little bit of a change. Okay, so I really like this look, the brilliance. Now actually I can go to the other light and start turning this on. Two, five, okay. What do we have here? This is 20. What about we set this to 40? This gets actually very strong. We can go maybe to here, 40. And if we take a look at the ground, we can see this is all completely washed out. 
way, way too much. So let's go back to 10. And also here we go to 10. Okay. This actually is getting close to the way how this looks. The plastic, when we zoom in, is a little bit darker here. And there we, it's too bright. So we can select the object. Then we go to material and say base color. Mm, we are already pretty, pretty dark. We can switch this down to black. Then we're getting close, but perfect black as perfect white is not something that really exists in real life. We can render it, but that's unrealistic. So we can gently lift this up a little bit. Now with the specularity, this also specifies how reflective is the surface. So this is now super reflective and you can see how strong the reflection is. Or I simply make this a little bit lower. And we covered the roughness to make this very sharp or actually a little bit blurry. Okay. And there you see how I am actually matching the look using the reference photo and then trying to simulate this. The black is still a tick too bright. It's a little bit lower. E yeah, we're getting close. Okay, yeah, that's not too bad. The ground here, the paper is a little bit um, more grayish, so we can click our backdrop. Also here we have a base color, a roughness, a specularity. To see the reflection better, a little trick, we set this to black because then we can see a, a bright reflection on a black surface. If we make this a white material, now you can see the reflection, but it is very difficult to see. It doesn't actually look too bad. Nice rendering, no? Yeah, you see, the environment can be very important also. So let's go back. We want to match this a little bit with an eyedropper. I can eyedrop this color. It's pretty close. The reflection is too strong. We can lower this there, then the roughness a little bit up. We can lower this color with the mouse wheel. Actually, I'm, I'm adjusting the color or here, the slider. Oh, maybe like this. Okay, cool. Here again with the camera, based on where I am, you see the reflection is stronger or weaker. So the more I'm parallel, the stronger the ground reflection, the more I'm more perpendicular to the ground, the less the reflection is strong. Okay. With mouse wheel, let's zoom out. The last thing maybe we want to do now is this camera is really big and my object is kind of small. Again, I'm teaching this by thinking about rendering, drawing um, inspiration from photography. No, here, no, I use a camera. And when we select the camera, go then to camera, we have actually lots of very useful elements we can set up. We can turn on in viewport display, uh, for example, a pass per two. You see how the outside is cut. This helps me really to frame what I see. Compositional guides. We can have thirds. Maybe I zoom in a little bit more so you see them and turn off the rendering. There you can see the lines, thirds, center, diagonals, ratio, and so forth. Okay. 
I would like the camera to get closer to the object. Okay, I move the camera closer. I can press S to scale this down, or I can also use here the scale command and scale the icon. But with S, it's really super easy. S for scale, R for rotate, and G for move. A little bit closer, move this down. And by scaling this icon, I'm not really making the camera bigger or smaller. I'm just making the icon easier to see or can hide it. I would like to, instead of being this uh, landscape, a vertical, so a portrait image. I don't adjust the camera. I simply here adjust the image format. So I go to output properties and there I have it. 1920 by 1080. When we set this to 1000 by 1000, it's a rectangle square. If I set this to 500 by 1000 pixels, there you see now this is vertical. If I flip this, there, super easy, no? I don't have to use 500, I can also use 700 by 1000, okay. When we go back to the camera, we can also zoom out. So we have a, um, kind of like a wide angle or we zoom in. So we have more a tailor. So maybe a 90 millimeter is pretty good. I very often work in something in the range between 50 and 90. This actually gives me more the look of a tailor zoom without the issue of the wide angle. The lines look a little bit less foreshortened. So in for perspective or shortening. And uh, this is also how I work in photography. So for example, let's go back to my uh, iPhone screenshot here, you see 2.5, 1 and 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is wide uh, angle, normal and tailored lens. And again here, so tailored lens, maybe normal and wide angle. Now you can see how this is distorted. And when I zoom in really the image does not turn into a two point perspective, but it, it will look less perspectively distorted. That makes it more pleasing for the eye when we do product photography. Okay, we can move this up or down a little bit. I can, the way how I very often work, I go to a side view in this case, maybe a wireframe mode so I can see where everything is. Go up and down and then I press R to rotate my view. So you see how I'm rotating the camera on this viewport and pay attention to how this looks there. How does this look when we render it from here? Let's get closer. Pretty nice, looks very superimposed. When I bring this up, then I can look more down. There actually another really interesting feature for those who are uh, do architecture photography. Check this out. So I can maybe look from here. So you see how I'm looking horizontal and I can see this tab and uh, not tab, the top of the cap. That's very nice, but I would like to see the rest of the bottle. If I do this however, I look down and then I get perspective for shortenings. Um, perspective or shortenings. Take a look at this cube, which I'm quickly putting in here. Now you can see how these vertical lines are going down. Welcome to perspective looks. But now I would like to see the top um, of the cap but not take a look at the bottle from this position down. So what we can do is I uh, press N, make this zero, oh, what's this minus 190? Well, yeah, 90. Then I move this one down till I kind of like see as much of my cap as I want. Okay. 
So this gives me a good preview. And now I shift the camera down. So I'm moving simply the image up or down. I'm still looking straight forward. But as you can see now, I can see the top without the object being very distorted. So that's called a, um, a shift lens. Super expensive for an actual uh, camera. Here, it, it's very cheap. It's built in. That's how we can set up the cameras. Okay. There is obviously a lot more to talk about, but I would like to wrap this one up. I can bring this over now a little bit more. The last thing that is left is to manipulate the material for the plastic. So it has a nice structure similar to the reference we can see here. And then we need to put this label onto it. As always, always say hi to your best friend. Save on a regular basis. Let's take a look at the plastic material with the mouse wheel. I will zoom in and then there you can see that it is a little bit blurry at the edges and which is okay, but otherwise we're kind of like missing this structure we can see here. And I will show you how we get this structure onto it. In real life, this plastic surface has a true three-dimensional structure. In computer graphics, we're not going to rebuild this. That would be impossible. Or I wouldn't say impossible, but it would be insane to try to do this. What we rather will do is we will generate a material that will be used to adjust the look. Material? Okay, how do we do this? Welcome to Nodes. We go to here, click on this, and then we say Shader Editor. Then we can press N, middle mouse button, we can drag this to there. Mouse wheel, we can zoom in a little bit, and then you will see, oh, this looks very familiar. This is all we have here. When I change this, you see it's one-to-one -one the same. And I have something called a normal. Think about normal, take a, um, your hand and then point um, a pen perpendicular onto your hand. So that's the face normal or a piece of paper. Each side of the sheet of paper has a vector that's perpendicular to the sheet of paper. And we would like to adjust the, the highlights. So the reflections, the shadows to give us the illusion of a three-dimensional structure. And that's done by manipulating the normal. Okay, that was a lot of normal talk. Let's do it. We go to add and input and texture. Nope, that was the wrong one. Input texture coordinates. Okay. So I said actually um, just texture. I'm, it has to be texture coordinate when I selected the correct one. Then we go to add um, uh, textures and here is noise. Very good. So let's drag this color onto here and then drag object to here. We can zoom out a little bit. And here you can see something is kind of going on there. Let's change this to 500. Oh, look at that. There is a noise pattern. When we set this to 2000, it's getting smaller. The most will you see, I'm zoom in or zoom out. And with the factor, that's a black and white version. Okay. So this, what's happening here is we have the material and we say for the color, sh um, create myself a noise texture and then let it flow over the object at the scale of 2000. So this can be very useful for this. We disconnect it, so click and drag, add, then we go to vector and bump. A lot of people are racing on the street where I live. I have two kids, not super happy. I wish I could put down some speed bumps, um, but these are not speed bumps. These are however similar bumps. 
just for CG. The factor I will drag into the height. So there, huh? important. And then normal goes to there. And take a look what's happening. We can see actually this noise texture which we created, but now that turns it kind of like into a dragon or snake skin. The strength is way too strong, 0.1. Oh, look at that. Maybe 0 0.05. Hmm, even better. Let's compare it to our reference. Okay. Um, the effect here is to big so the scale so we change this to 5000 yeah this actually starts to look good and maybe the strength is too strong 0 0.25 maybe yeah and you see it's it starts to match and then maybe the roughness we can increase a little bit Um, maybe 0 0.4. Oops, 0 0.04 I meant. Maybe 0.5 for the roughness. So I'm just playing with the values and paying attention to how this will adjust the material look. Yeah, and that is already the basic building block for a plastic material for CG. Not only how to do this in Blender, this is just a standard uh, process. We have a material with color and reflectivity and surface roughness. And then we have a channel where we could uh, manipulate the normal via bump mapping and a procedural or fractal texture. At this point, I would say we can keep the material as is. That looks pretty good. How can we now very easily apply the same illusion of a three-dimensional surface structure to our yellow cap? And that's actually super easy. So I have my black bottle selected. Here is the material for it, plastic black. And then here in the node editor, with shift, I select these three notes, control C to copy, select my yellow cap. Here, maybe we can rename this plastic yellow and then control V with my mouse inside the node editor. And then I connect this. Very good. Now, the roughness is really high. So I will lower this, maybe I'll point 0.1. And then when we zoom in a little bit more now we can see that there is something happening on the surface also here on top let's disconnect this for a moment and there you see it. this is kind of kind of flat this is all too perfect so this um procedural texture we created to then um roughen up the reflection really gives it a, a good natural irregularity okay so with all this done what else is missing well we take a look at this actually the label let's go to our reference photo here so how can we make this label also here the answer to that is pretty simple we simply borrow from reality in real life we produce the plastic bottle. A graphic designer makes the design for the label. Then we print it on adhesive material and roll glue the label over the plastic body or bottle. And pretty much we can do the same digitally. Minus the problem that while we uh, have in real life the physicality of a bottle preventing the label to go into the bottle, digitally that can happen but again we can simply make this label the same way how we would do this in real life so let's quickly go to here so you see i uh, in 
Affinity Designer, something like Illustrator from Adobe, I redesigned this label very quickly. And now I need to figure out how do I get this over here. And I said, when I would like to have a label there, well, I need to model the label the same way. Because in, in real life, I have this label and I can move it around and then fold it or bend it, glue it over the bottle. And here we model the label where it should be. Let's go to 3D viewport. Then I zoom in a little bit, click the bottle. You see my zoom in doesn't go completely in. I'm kind of like reaching the end. When this happens, simply go to view frame selected, AKA this means um, zoom to the selected object. And now I can much easier zoom in and out <clears throat> and rotate around. Let's go to shaded view. I will rotate to this view so you see what we're doing. And I would like to create a cylinder that has a similar or basically the same cone shape like this bottle, perfectly from the top centered. How can we do this? First, let's click on Z here. And there you see, there is a yellow dot. I rotate my view. There's the yellow or orange dot. That's actually the object center. Same for the yellow cap. Because this is a perfectly round object, cylindrical. Uh, and when we exported this from Fusion, it created this center point. Now what I can do is, I have here this 3D cursor, which I can click and drag around. I can position this right there. So I have this bottle selected, then shift S selection to a uh, cursor to select it, or shift S cursor to world origin. World origin, that's basically X, Y, and Z zero. In Fusion, we also modeled this bottle perfectly centered in our world, which is why here we have these two options. This 3D cursor is very useful in Blender for two things. Um, one time, or in one case, when we rotate and scale, we can rotate around this point or scale towards this point. And when we create an object, this will function as the insert position. So think about it as a three-dimensional point in space, X, Y, and Z. Let's press N and then go to view. And there you see a 3D cursor, the location X, Y, and Z zero. And when I click and drag here, you can see how this cursor goes up and down. I can even say like at a height of two centimeters, be there. Now, you can press N to hide this palette. Let's go to add, mesh, and then circle. There's a circle, don't click anything yet. Go to add circle, click on this triangle. This is the menu for the, um, the command to add a circle now. Here we have vertices and radius. Let's set radius to three. And for vertices, um, let's click and drag this to the left. You see with three, it's a triangle with six, um, or eight now, and then we have an octagon. So these are the amount of segments. The reason why I'm pointing this out is it's kind of important because the bottle is a polygon mesh that we ideally in a perfect case have the exact amount of vertices. So um, like the bottle, so we have like one edge of this circle matches one edge of the black body, so the bottle. This sounds very confusing and, um, or very theoretical, and is also in practical terms, really complicated to do. But basically what I mean, um, let's make maybe this a little bit uh, smaller, that's too small, 2.5. 
so here you know, we have 10. Let's go with 20 and maybe 30. You see, actually, you now more of the circle is visible. And with 10 segments, many of these edges are inside the bottle. So that's kind of like the problem I'm trying to point out. It's really difficult to make this perfectly fit. So we can at least try to have something that is close. We will end up with a little air gap between the label and the bottle. And in the rendering, it doesn't matter. You won't see this. Okay, so enough talk about the circle. This is all good. Then let's go here in this view to a front view or side view. I also want to stop the rendering. Um, why? Where is it? Where's the bottle? Oh, there it is. Okay. So shift middle mouse button. I center this a little bit. So there you can see now the ring is actually at a height of two centimeters. When I press N, you see it starts at two centimeters. And when we take a look at here, now that hmm, is pretty close. Let's actually put this at 1.5 centimeters. So you see this move down a little bit. Then <clears throat> in the next step, this is now the interesting part, we go into edit mode. AA, AA, so A selects everything, AA deselects everything. Very easy shortcut. And then when I press S in this left view, you can see how I scale this down till it fits actually the um, the cone shape. Then I can press E for extrude. And then after that is done and I move my mouse, you see we are moving actually the extruded geometry. I want this to go straight up. So this is the Z axis. So I press the Z key. Now my mouse, my mouse can go left and right, but the geometry can only go up or down. Maybe till here. I don't know. Let's compare. It's actually a little bit lower. To move this down, G and Z. So G for grab and then press the Z key for the Z axis. There we are. Now, here we can clearly see this is not good. So we have to scale this. Well, press S for scale. And then we scale this very close till then. This is too far. Mm, not enough. Mm, maybe. Okay. This is good. When we zoomed to down here, press AA to deselect everything. Hold the Alt or Option key and then click on an edge. And then you see this selects the complete ring or loop. And then we can press S uh, and then C, move the mouse very gentle. And I'm actually really close. So I press escape and leave it where we are. Very good. There's one more step we have to do. I go into this three dimensional view, switch to edge selection, go to Z, so the top view, here's my camera. This is the backdrop. This is the, the back of the label. So I zoom in and then I click this vertical edge. You see how this is lined up? Okay. So this line is, think about it as um, an edge. Think about it, we have a sheet of paper and when we fold it, we can turn this into an open cylinder and then we can glue it together. And we're doing kind of like the, the opposite. Think about this as a folded piece of paper that's glued together and we would like to cut this open. So we will add a seam here. With this edge selected, go to edge and then clear seam. Uh, sorry, <laughs> mark seam AA. And you see there's a red line. So what did this funny thing actually do? Let's go to here. 
and then we go to UV editor. And in this view, press A to select everything, UV and say unwrap. And you see how this is unwrapped into this band because it took this edge and then went this way and unwrapped it. Let's actually say clear seam. Okay, and unwrap. You see now this is one piece. And that's the reason why, um, or this as one piece, it's not really useful for us. That's the reason why we uh, UV unwrap it. So again, we select this edge, go to mark seam, A, unwrap, perfect. This is slightly rotated. So inside the UV editor. So what's the UV editor? What does UV actually mean? This UV, think about it as X and Y in a two-dimensional coordinate system. This might actually sound right now a little bit abstract, but once we load in an image, it will make really sense what we're doing here. This label I would like to rotate. So I press, uh, but I would like to rotate it around this center point here. You remember when I talked about the 3D cursor, in this case, now it's a 2D cursor, that it can work as a rotation uh, tool. So check this out. We will say, do the rotation around the 2D cursor. Then I press T for the toolbar, click on 3D, 2D cursor, drag this to here, and then shift S. Uh, do we have cursor to pixel? Let's see. Cursor to pixel, uh, not necessarily. Um, yeah, I wanted to actually I tried to get this really close. Shift S, cursor to pixel, zoom in more. Yeah, this is now super uh, close. Why pixel? Well, this is an image, will be an image. So we can snap to a pixel of an image. Okay, with all that done, let's press A to select everything and then R for rotate. And you see when I move my mouse, then it rotates. And then I can type in nine zero negative and enter. Negative basically so that it rotates the opposite way. Cool. So you see we rotated it around this center point. And everything rotated around the 2D cursor because here we said for the rotation, rotate around this center point or 2D cursor. Now we can go back to this and be happy. At this point, you might ask yourself, what is going on here? And no worries, I'm going to explain this actually right now. To go back, however, um, again, this is a three dimensional body and onto this or over this, we want an image to appear. So we need to help the software to understand what material or texture should go onto each of these faces. So what I'm going to show you right now, just only Pay attention to it. You don't necessarily have to repeat it. If you want, you can. So what I will do is actually, I will go to UV editor uh, and then UV menu, export UV layout. I will go to my project folder and then here UV layout label and export it. Okay, then in any program, I will open that image. There it is. And you will see there's just an image with the kind of like an, an, a layer that looks like, and you guessed it, the UV layout. Okay, so let's do quickly this. I will right at the center create a circle. And this one I make red. Then I will here make myself a rectangle and I rotate this rectangle 
parallel to these lines. Very nice. And I will right here make a really long rectangle. And then also maybe I make this one blue here, one shape. And this one I make green and I will make something here. I will make this yellow. Very good. Okay. So this image I will now export. Then in Blender, this grid system basically means uh, while I have this UV unwrapped, there's no image yet. So I will go to image, open, and then here, open this one. Open, zoom out a little bit. Yeah, and look at that. You see there is actually the image and you see our label wraps over it. So what does this now mean? Let's go in the 3D view to render and we don't see anything. That's also normal. And that is because this label doesn't have any material yet. So click to the material properties, new. We can make this orange. So you see this is really the material, but we don't really see this uh, image, this texture pop up. Okay, so we have to go to the shader editor. That's the easiest way to do. You see here, this is the basic material, the color, and that one we would like to overwrite. So we go to add and texture, image. We will select, or I will select this image I created, plug color to color. That basically means that this will be overwritten by the, um, the image I added. Okay. So, and then we can see there is actually something going on. So if, if we now go back to the UV editor and now this really becomes actually very clear. You see here the red line, that's the seam. One side, here's the other side of the seam. Um, this part of the green circle is there. This part of the orange circle is there. So when I go to face select and just select this part, you can see what face of my geometry is occupying what area of the image. Okay. So this basically now shows really clearly that the way how this works is the software takes a face and then whatever is uh, under the face on this image is being projected or shown on the face here. Good. Now, when we would like to design a label, um, the way how this is UV unwrapped is also correct. The label in real life would also be this way, but this means that in a program like Illustrator, I can design my label, uh, for example, this way. But then if I want to present this, I would need to um, bend in Illustrator this image ideally, so that, for example, these vertical lines will line up with these rotated vertical lines. That's doable. Um, we, however, will do uh, or take a small shortcut and simply change the shape of this. But before we continue, um, I will go to Affinity Designer. There we are. Very good. And um, I will simply select everything here and copy. Go to here, I will delete all these elements, paste this in nicely centered. So there we are, move this down a little bit, roughly to here. Very good. 
And then um, this background image here, this one I will hide. And then this I can now export. And this image I will share with you. The download link is inside the description of the video. So from this point now, you can actually follow. So let me quickly export this as a PNG. So I have a transparent background. I will call this logo label. Then I go back to Blender. And then here I will open this image now. There we are. We don't really see anything here changed. That is because um, inside the node editor, it still uses the, the old image. So I could go back to here and open this. There we are. Okay, and then we see two problems. And I will show you how to fix this. So back to UV editor. First, yes, the image is rotated. So the mesh is actually flipped. We can go to UV mirror and this is the X axis. Cool. Now, when I click on the camera, now we are in front, there we can see now that the lines are incorrect now because on the label, <laughs> really the lines go vertical down, but they should go more kind of like, like the cone. So here's now the, the useful trick. I will hold the Alt key or Option key and click on this lower edge. I have this turned on, very good. And then I press S for scale. And when I move my mouse, you see how this scales. Then I press the Z key. Um, oh, why doesn't it? Oh, sorry, not Z, the Y key, because it's X and Y. And then you see if I move my mouse down to the center point, this curve gets flat. And to make this perfect, I simply press zero and enter. Let's do the same here. Press the Alt or Option key, click on this edge, S, Y, zero, enter. Yep, this looks actually better now. Um, now I can say G and Z, move this a little bit up. I can go here, Alt, left mouse button, click G and Y, move this a little bit further down. Alt click on this edge. And this is actually pretty good, but um, the problem here is that ideally I want these lines, not angled, but straight vertical to easily do this. I just press S to scale and scale this till they are yeah, kind of vertical. Cool. Okay. Now, if you if we pay attention to our label, we can see, wow, it actually is, looks like a cone. But when we go to our um, reference here, this label goes much wider. Okay. That's an easy fix. All we need to do is here again, when I select these faces where the label is on, there you can see it, but these two faces, which are left and right, they should be part of this too, and they are not. And the trick is I will select everything here, and then in here I press A to select everything, and then I will scale this along the x-axis and pay attention to the label. So S and X and make this smaller. By making this smaller, you see I make the um, the logo to go wider. And maybe like this. Let me in here go to a 3D view so you can better see what's going on. S and Y, you see how the label gets being stretched nearly from one side to the back to the other side of the back. There. And that is actually kind of like UV mapping in a nutshell. 
So I'll go back to the camera view, click on this icon, S and Y, make this a little bit bigger till I start seeing these edges come in there. Very nice. S and Y, maybe make this a little bit smaller if I want to. Uh, this is okay. Pressed tab, or here I can go to object mode, appear this way, and there we are. We have a little bit of a faceting going on here. So right click and say shade smooth, or I think it is also uh, shade smooth for the object there. Now, when I zoom in, you see here, these facets are actually gone. If we shade flat, there you see all the polygon faces. This is just an illusion. It doesn't make it round. It just renders it smoothly. When you zoom in more, we can see there are still the facets. Okay, very nice. So, and to hide this, this looks actually not too bad. AA to deselect everything. And for a quick rendering, or let's say a presentation with a client, this is actually really pretty good. But um, there are a few elements we need to fix. For example, the logo we would like to pull further down. And then we also need to remove kind of like the rest here that hangs over. And maybe we would like to make the label also a tick rounder so it flows nicer, more snug over this bottle. And that's basically what we are going to do in the next step. So home stretch. When we take a look at this a result of the rendering, the label is kind of okay, but we can clearly see that there is something wrong on the outside. The main problem here is we have actually this bigger geometry onto which we map this label. But then while well, we kind of like actually have nothing that makes this area transparent. And that's key now. So I'll go back to the camera view. Go to, by the way, switch this one so we can select objects. Then we go to the shader editor. And we have reflectivity, roughness, and look at that, alpha. Okay, so let's make this less solid. Um, okay, <laughs> where is my label? Well, now I made the label completely transparent. That's not really what I want either. So, hmm, how can we do this? It's actually called masking. Think about when you have a piece of paper and you cut a hole into it and you take a, a spray can and you spray over the paper, it leaves then the shape you cut out on the surface where you're spraying onto. We kind of like do the reverse. We want to mask the outside transparent while keeping the label uh, not transparent. The trick here is actually the alpha value, so the transparency value of our image. When I go back to affinity, you see here this checkerboard that basically means that's transparent. This is not transparent. There are some colored pixels. And that information, any 3D program for rendering, well, Blender obviously is one, can understand and work with. So here, this alpha, I will drag to here. And then there, it's gone. You see that? When I click somewhere, then it's deselected. Perfect. To make this label, for example, also a tick um, more snug. So I will click this label again and zoom in. I will turn this alpha off for the moment. You see how we have this, um, oh yeah, particular here. This looks kind of bad. So we want to prevent this. We need to make this ring, or not this ring, this cone smoother. Go to modifier with this 
uh, label cone selected, add modifier, and then we select subdivision surface. And then set this to two or three. We don't really need to go further. And now you see, hey, this looks nice and round. It's not really that it became round. It simply got much finer. There you see every time I add a level, it duplicates the polygon count and makes it softer. So that's what actually subdivision surface modeling does. Good. Okay, so with that done, what we can now do in theory, uh, we'll go to here to 3D viewport. Here I will zoom in a lot. Then here I will zoom to there. Go to edit mode, edge select, press the and hold the alt key, click this edge. And then I press S to scale and move my mouse very gentle and pay attention to at one point does it intersect. So you see, I can get super close. I can hold the shift key to go in very small steps. When I do not hold the shift key, the mouse movement is actually uh, faster. And there we are. You also saw here there were some artifacts where the surface was intersecting. Perfect. Another little trick is for the subdivision. I can turn this icon here on. Pay attention to what happens here. Now you see how it displays actually the final polygon shape. There for rendering, we also want these numbers to match. Very good. Now, if we want, we can zoom here to the bottom. This is maybe a little bit more difficult to see. Uh, where do we have the plane? Is this the plane? This is the ground. Yes, so let's hide it. Then we can see this better from the bottom. There we are. This is actually really tight already. So Alt, left mouse button, click. And then S, hold the Shift key, and then move it till it looks good, like this. Let's verify through the camera. Perfect. OK, very nice. Um, Maybe not. Let's compare to here and uh, this distance to here. Is this actually good? On top, maybe on the bottom, I feel my version is too tall. Okay, so that means I go to a front view. G and Z move this one down a little bit. And then I press S till it sticks out. G and Z a little bit down. And S and move this in a little bit. And I pay attention to here the rendering. When does the other geometry stick through? It's kind of like there. Very good. OK. So now I stretched actually the mesh a little bit. I can leave edit mode, go to object mode. By having the geometry stretched, I'm also stretching the image. Think about you have a balloon and you print, you draw a smiley on the balloon and then you blow up the balloon. The smiley face will be stretched because we're inflating the balloon. Same thing kind of like happened here. Let's go to UV editor. Then we go into edit, press A to select everything. And also here, alt click on this edge, G and Y, we move this up. Or the opposite way you see how we are stretching it. And then mouse wheel, zoom in and out, alt click on this, zoom out G and Y, move this down, okay. Yeah, good. This starts to get a little bit stretched. So maybe G and Y, I move this up a little bit more to there. And you see now this is not as bad vertically. 
if we compare this to our image here, we can see there's also more space there. So my label is a little bit off and <clears throat> I will change this by going to here and extending this a little bit, maybe like this, very nice, perfect. And now I will export it one more time. PNG, by the way, PNG or JPEG, um, not JPEG, we always use PNG. One main reason, two, JPEGs have compression artifacts and JPEGs can't show transparent backgrounds. PNGs don't have compression artifacts, can show transparent backgrounds. So export, and then uh, what name did we give this PNG? So logo label, I will call this one two because that is the second version I'm giving to you. And save, very good. Then back to Blender. Now I would like to replace this. So image, open, there's label two. Also here, now this didn't really change anything. Oh, I can adjust this geometry, G and Y, a little bit higher. And then for the material, I can do this in this dialog here too. Select this. Okay, now this is better now. Leave the edit mode, AA to deselect everything. Then we will turn this plane here on. Okay. This is maybe a little bit, if we compare, maybe stretched. So we leave this. We don't have to make this perfect because we're having already a pretty long video. I want to bring this to an end. So we reapply this transparency effect. Um, also here, this image open and, oh, why is actually this now happening? Uh, um, okay. Uh, interesting, this is, the correct material. Yeah, it is. So let's call this label. There we are. Okay. Um, I make a little pause because I need to figure out what was going on here, why this actually now looks different. I quickly figured out what was going on. It does not necessarily make sense, um, but I noticed when I made this object transparent and then press S to scale and move the mouse away and scale the object up bigger, it's transparent. When I go down at one point, it will become black. I have to be very careful about the position or here you can see it's just a small step. So I must have been so super lucky that I just positioned the geometry. Maybe it is so close that the two surfaces are intersecting or negatively influencing each other for the render engine. So um, math problem aside, what's the practical solution here? We simply make this label a tick bigger. So S and then very gentle, we move the mouse till this is gone. Surely you have the same issue. And then that's it. Then we can reapply the connection for the image, reapply the connection for the transparency. The outside is all gone. Last thing maybe to point out, because the label is its own object, its own material, we can make it completely flat. So no reflectivity. We can make this high glossy. We, yeah, literally can play with it as much as we want. Um, ideally, maybe match it a little bit, or if we want this label to really stick out nicely, we can have, for example, this really strong reflection over it, but then now uh, we can see this a little bit odd. Um, for this rendering. So we will kind of like try to do something that blends the reflection of the light 
to the reflection on the, the plastic body. Okay, and that's basically now everything for how to create the materials and do the UV unwrapping and the label. There's more we could do, but again, now we want to bring this video to an end. And to finish this, now we want to do some actual renderings. So, rendering. Uh, we're actually going to revisit a little bit the lighting and balancing everything out, color management, and then how can we do our rendering. Let's actually switch this back to 3D viewport, uh, middle mouse button, and then rotate around, shift middle mouse button, and pan. Okay. And here I will move this to the side. Very good. And let's say this is all pretty, pretty nice. We're very happy. Is this actually good? How does this compare to our reference? Yeah. Mm, is there any difference? I mean, my piece here looks a little bit more orange. Also, this label is a little bit more orange. And in my rendering, this is a little bit more yellowish. Hmm, what's going on here? So one of the main reason for this is there is a lot of light inside the scene that brightens up everything more than I want. So how can we fix this? Well, we select a light and lower it. Do they need to be that bright? And then you see, well, the color is actually coming back a little bit. We can also go to the world, maybe 0.1, brighten everything up a little bit, maybe 0.5. Oh, this is too much, 0.2. Yeah, okay. Zero, uh, 0.5. 0.2. So it's up to you to um, adjust with this. Do you want to have a more um, softer illumination? Do you want to have a harsher illumination? We can also, in here you see we have these flags. We can also this way very quickly turn the light on and off. Looks actually quite nice with just one light. It's very dramatic. We can see everything coming from the left side, but it looks like something is missing. So here, since our reference photo has a, a light left on the right side, we put this one back on. Okay, so that was actually not too bad. Let's go back to the camera and go down to color management. And for those who are interested in, we also have exposure and gamma, particularly those who are in photography more, we can in addition, play with these values and then see when we map the image, a tone map the image, how does this work out? We're not going to use this too much. I just wanted to point this one out so people understand that there are actually these functions we can use. There is even an use curve. So when I turn this on, I scroll down. So what does curve mean? Similar like in Photoshop when you have a gradation curve. Here we can do the same. I'm click and drag, and then I click and drag this one up. So I'm creating an S curve. And what this basically means is um, with this point going down, darker values will be darker, and then brighter values will be brighter. Brighter because this point is above the diagonal. And if I go this way, the brighter will be darker. Um, if I go this way, darks will be brighter. Can do actually pretty cool, funny stuff. Move things around. And there we are. Okay, so let's delete these parts again. This is more a little bit at the beginning for those who are into Photoshop a lot and uh, digital photography or photography. A lot of these tools we use there, we can find here too. So, um, so the image is done. Uh, let's take a look at it. 
is there something we would like to do better? Yes, there are a few things. You see down here, there is a lot of noise. Noise, uh, how does this even, this rendering work? Because when we notice, when we zoom in and zoom out, there is this grain. Take a look at this number here, path tracing sample 24, 28, 30, and then it stops. Rendering done. It's not really the renderings done, simply the viewport finished refining this image 32 times. Think about it, the samples, these numbers as every time it adds more pixels to it. When we set this to four, we will have super fast renderings. See, it stops at four if we go two even faster, but we have a lot of grain. So every uh, additional sample will give us more uh, or give us less grain. So with that said, how do we actually render something nice and clean? Well, we could set this to a value. No, this is 64 till, for example, this grain naturally really cleans up. That's definitely a doable way, but also a wasteful way because the more samples we have, if I set this to 200, well, the longer the rendering takes. And this is now uh, a quite interesting part because I will switch also to show you the differences um, between this version of Blender and the test version because soon version uh, 3.0 will come out and then this can be updated. So I set this to viewport 32 and then I zoom in a little bit and then you see then it renders and renders and cleans this stuff up. Okay, let's here go to denoise and turn this viewport on and you see this actually very smooth and then kind of blurry and then step by step details come back. This is also rendering a little bit slower. You see the numbers, but when I zoom further out and then go to the ground, you see, interesting, that grain actually is gone. So what this denoising does is instead of having many samples till the image is clean, where the software sees areas it can smooth out, it filters the noise out and then continues step by step to clean this up. Now 32 looked actually pretty good. Let's set this to 32. So this is the start sample. You will see when I go in and out here, I will go to there. This will run up to th um, 32 and then the denoising will kick in. Now here we didn't really see much. So this means the denoising did not filter out too many elements there. If we go down to here, you will see once this hits 32, this noise is gone. Ta-da! Isn't that awesome? What happens when we set this to uh, 10? We maybe say 10, and also here we set this to 10. Zoom out and zoom in. Actually, I will go to this area up there. You see the denoising removed a little bit of detail but it's still pretty good, but it we lost a little bit of detail. So maybe 30 will be good, and then we set this to 30. Again, this is just beginner setup, um, and also that there's more to it, but I leave this um, more at a beginner entry level. So this is pretty good. Okay, so this was version, the official one, uh, 2.93. And when I go now to the current test version, and I will load the same file to here. There we are. 
go to here. There we have viewport denoiser and render denoiser. So it's pretty much the same. I will mouse wheel, scroll, turn this on here, uh, turn this on. There you see how it cleans this up. Now, for those who are brave enough, if you want to, actually, I would work with the this version. Why? It renders faster. It's actually really nice. But if you, because this program can have bugs, or would rather want to play safe, then use the current version 2.93 till 3.0 is public and final. Okay. For the rendering, then we can set this for denoising too. Uh, advance, um, we can keep all this where we are. So how do we now save this as an image? Okay, I will stop the rendering here and then go back to the other version since we work in the um, public version. So this is back 2.93. Now to create a rendering, let's go to output. So this image I'm going to render is 70, uh, 700 pixels by 1000 pixels. That is how big this image will be. I can render 50% size-wise of it, 10%. I can render actually it three times bigger, so 300%. I'm not really changing these numbers. I can just play with the percentage 10 times faster. Then uh, let's go back to here. So the denoising, yeah, this is all good for sampling. Uh, we can turn here this on, adapter sampling. I'm not explaining what it does uh, in detail. Let me say this way, it figure out where our noisy areas and tries to clean this up better instead of cleaning everything up equally because that's slower. So this is a nice possible speed up. Um, rendering, yeah, we, NLM, then that, that should work. Okay, very good. Let's hit save. And then let's click render. And then you see all these interesting small tiles popping up. And if you pay attention to, sometimes there's a tile that's noisy and then later that noise is gone. That's when the denoiser popped in. Yeah, done. There's our image. Now this image, we can go ahead, go image and save as. Um, we can PNG, kitchen bouquet, and then we could say product rendering, save image, Perfect. Now, just to show you how um, this works differently, when we make this 200%, we go to slot two, and then here again, say render. There now we see is this image is bigger, it takes a little bit slower. This is currently rendering on an M1 Mac mini. It's not too bad. The denoising really helps. And it uses the 128 samples actually for the rendering. So this 30 and 30, that is actually for the viewport. This is for the rendering, what you see here. So we will actually wait till this is done. Because I would like to show you one option. And then we are really done. Okay, um, there's a denoising, good. So this took 53 seconds. Let's go to here again, uh, slot three. We set this maybe to 30. So 128 to 30, it's kind of like well, um, four times less. And you see it's actually much, much faster.
But when we zoom in now, there you can see because of less samples, we also have less detail because of the denoising that's working. The reason why I'm pointing this out is simply we need to balance out the um, idea of speed, so the amount of samples, and then the denoising, um, how much details would we like to filter out? Or are we okay with being filtered out? When I go back to slot two, yeah, now well, I we see more in it. Also, when I go to here, slot three, there's more noise here that didn't really perfectly get filtered out. Might have been also an artifact here. So 30 is really low. Let's do one more, maybe with 60. And then let's do a rendering. And then we can see actually that soaks out quite a lot. So maybe the 128 um, or 200 was not really bad. Honestly, something like 30 is really low. I'm just really pushing the limits here. But also if this is just for a quick rendering only, um, let's say I am do this for a layout. Then I can do a quick rendering and then when everything's done, final presentation, then I put in the numbers for a good rendering. Okay, so peace out. This is everything.